Good afternoon and welcome to Preferred Utilities Monthly Webinar. Today we're going to talk about the top seven most common fuel system design mistakes that we see. And I have with me today Robert Bond from Preferred's New York City representative, Analytical and Combustion Systems, or ACS for short. Robert is an expert at designing fuel systems to meet New York City codes. And because so much of our audience is from New York City, and they ask a lot of questions, particular to New York City, that usually stump me, we decided to have Robert on this webinar as well. So welcome, Robert. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, David. Happy to be here. All right. So I want to start off with a word of warning. Um, most of our webinars are 90 to 100% informative, non-commercial. This one, uh, not so much. But you don't need to panic. You don't need to find a mask and run to the grocery store and buy toilet paper. You're going to be OK. So don't worry, if you've recently had a big project dumped in your lap that includes a generator or boiler fuel system, all of our previous fuel handling webinars were recorded and put on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and search on Preferred Utilities, hit the Videos tab, and you'll see all of our previously recorded videos. So mistake number one that we see. Uh, we see design engineers uh, giving contractors and suppliers too many choices. And I'll show you a real life example here where this engineer gave the contractor a choice of seven different pump set manufacturers. Although some of these pump manufacturers don't make fuel pumps. Uh, maybe that's why there's so many choices. The contractor was given a choice of four day tank manufacturers. And I think these four companies actually do make day tanks. Seven more choices for piping specialties. This section typically includes main tank accessories, field installed valves and instrumentation, and, and other ship loose devices. The way this specification was written, each of these product categories is an independent variable, so we can use math to determine how many different fuel systems are possible that meet this specification. Seven times four times seven is 196. So the contractor is really specifying the system, and the engineer and the owner have no idea what they're getting. And who is the least motivated to provide a reliable fuel system? A, the owner who needs a fuel system to feed the emergency generators that will keep their hospital open during a power interruption. B, the licensed consulting engineer who works for a national engineering firm who put their stamp on the drawings. Or C, the fuel system supplier has been in business 102 years and has four of the five owner's kids working for the company. Or D, the low bid contractor who won the project because they left the most stuff out of their estimate. Mm -hmm. In real life, you know how this is going to work. So obviously, the correct answer is D. And if the owner's engineer lets them, the contractor gets to design the fuel system for the emergency generators. There is a contractor spectrum. Some are super capable, reputable companies that have been in the same business for decades. Others are not, since most projects go to the lowest bidder or lowest acceptable bid, they're all incentivized to cut costs. So specification error number two that we see, specifying a Franken system. We see a lot of specifications that look like this. One manufacturer of the transfer pumps, in this case, submersible pumps, which aren't even allowed in New York City. Hmm. A different manufacturer for the leak detection and tank gauging system. And another manufacturer for the cable style leak detection system. Um, and another supplier for the fuel polishing system. Polishing systems can be separate from the rest of the fuel system, but there are advantages to integrating the polisher with the rest of the system. So a Franken system isn't the end of the world. A good fuel system specialist may be knowledgeable enough to put all these pieces together, apply high voltage, and bring the fuel system to life. It takes special licenses to install underground tanks and underground containment piping, so fuel systems with underground components are more likely to be installed by a qualified fuel system specialist. But above ground systems require no special licenses, we see plumbing contractors, HVAC contractors, and regular mechanical contractors get awarded fuel systems all the time. 
many of these contractors don't have the expertise to make a franking system work. And the problem is, is really more difficult than people realize. Finally, some of the gas station components that get specified don't play well with others. For, exist, for instance, the pump controls need to know if a leak is detected in a tank, and they need to know if a tank is at high level. Some of the tank gauges common in gas stations and often specified for diesel generator systems don't have relay outputs and analog outputs needed for the pump controls to do their job. So common specification error number three, cutting the fuel system into pieces. Sometimes the engineer encourages this bad behavior by putting the generator tanks in the electrical division of the specification and the rest of the fuel system in the mechanical division. The temptation is strong to do this when the generators are to be supplied with belly tanks, but preferred engineers can show you how to specify belly tanks and make sure the belly tank instrumentation is coordinated with the rest of the fuel system. On other projects, the contractors are given free reign to chop the fuel system into pieces. Sometimes we see where all of the fuel system components in the generator building are the responsibility of one contractor and everything outside the building goes to another contractor. And the problem with this is, is lack of coordination. And often uh, the contractors aren't technically savvy enough to integrate the two halves of the system together correctly. Fuel systems are not terribly complicated, but their control systems are. The minimum day tank wire count is eight wires for the PLS4. That's, that's preferred part number for the float switch assembly that does the pump controls. So there's eight conductors just on the, uh, the float switch pump controls. When you add in the leak detector, the fill solenoid, and the return pump, there's eight more conductors. So you're going to see a minimum of 16 conductors going to uh, from each day tank back to the control system. And that's just a, a fairly stripped down system. Um, if the day tank has a vent line switch, that's two more conductors. If there's a second solenoid valve in the flow control manifold, that's three more conductors. Uh, if there's a fill manifold flow switch, there's two more conductors. And if we're keeping track of the day tank oil temperature with a thermistor, there's three additional conductors. So a day tank can have as many as 26 conductors. And the signals for each of those conductors has to match what the control system is expecting or the system isn't going to work properly. And many systems have multiple day tanks. Um, our record at Preferred is uh, 28 day tanks in a single fuel system. The owner of that facility is top secret, but I'll give you a hint who they are. They are likely listening to this call right now. So if you cut the fuel system in pieces, who's going to put the pieces together again and make them work? Uh, the plumbing contractor, the HVAC contractor, an electrical contractor. If one of these contractors hires a dedicated fuel system specialist, uh, you have a pretty good chance. Otherwise, uh, you're gonna have a mess on your hands. These are some of the coordination issues preferred engineers have seen. No pumps at all between the main tanks and the day tanks. The fuel system contractor assumed there were supply pumps, uh, pull pumps in the generator enclosures, and there wasn't. We've seen single phase motor starters supplied for three phase pump motors. We've seen pump controls expecting float contacts to break on increasing oil level, but the day tank manufacturer supplied the opposite or a mix of breaking and making contacts on increasing fuel level. We've seen pump controls expecting four float switches in the day tank, but the tank is supplied with just two. We've seen mismatched coil voltages for relays and motor starters. And what we see quite often is day tanks are supplied with a small relay-based control system when the pump controls are expecting to wire directly to the day tank instruments themselves. And in this instance, we usually have to kind of strip away the controls that came on the day tank and, and get rid of the relay-based controls and go, go right to the instrumentation uh, like the preferred control system is expecting. 
So field wiring issues preferred technicians have seen include absolutely everything. Um, there's an expression, with enough monkeys and enough typewriters, you can recreate all the works of Shakespeare. Every morning, I read the service tickets for all the preferred service technicians for the day before, and you, you would not believe the installation mistakes our technicians find. I share the really interesting ones with the other technicians so they can learn by someone else's examples. And then I get emails back from the technicians with stories to top the one I just sent them. And it's not a contest. If it was, it'd be a really sick contest. So specification error number four that we see is not reconciling the specifications with the drawings and the schedules. The drawings and schedules are drawn just for this particular project. And the specifications are often copy pasted from a previous project or some kind of a standard. But the specifications trump the drawings. So when they don't match, it makes contractors and suppliers lives very difficult. In federal contracting, contractors and suppliers are responsible for pointing out these discrepancies. Otherwise, we can be held to the more expensive of the two. I'm seeing a new trend where engineers are able to get away with preparing just drawings and schedules and no specification at all. And if they're not going to match, I would prefer that, that there not be a specification. Um, and I think engineers prefer this too because it's less work um, when they can get away with it. Um, Preferred can help with this. We have an online tool where you can quickly answer some questions, use some pull down menus, and it'll spit out an entire uh, facility fuel oil specification section you can copy paste into a Word document. It is generic in terms of equipment preferred doesn't make like main tanks, but it's 100% it's preferred for the equipment we do make. Okay, mistake number five that we see. Um, and there's been a rash of this lately. I can think of two recent projects off the top of my head where the pumps on the schedule were the wrong discharge pressure for the application. Uh, there was an instance of this where we caught it uh, before we even bid the project, so we caught it nice and early. There's another example of this, and this was this was one of those top secret data centers that just goes by a project name. Uh, we were under an NDA, and we weren't shown all the drawings. We were just shown the schedule that, that had preferred pumps on it. And come to find out, you know, after the equipment gets in the field, the generators that we were supposed to be fueling are on top of a 30-story building. So the 50 PSI discharge uh, pumps that we supplied uh, weren't going to make it, and we had to swap those out with rotary screw pumps. And, and we got a change order, but, you know, nobody wants to see this happen. Uh, we'd rather design things right the first time. So... Um, you know, if the engineer is in a position where they can't share all the drawings because of secrecy or NDA requirements, you know, use use our pump and pipe sizing program and make sure that the pumps that you're specifying or the pumps that you're putting on the schedule will have enough flow and enough pressure uh, to meet the demands of the job. And, and if it is a, a normal job, but there isn't a bunch of secrecy, you know, we'll run this calculation too. We, we'd be glad to do it. So this is where you can find the uh, the preferred fuel system pump and pipe sizing calculator. Um, or you can just, uh, I think I usually just type in preferred sizing calculator. That's the first hit. Okay, so specification error number six, uh, the Burger King specification. And uh, for those of you under 50 years old, Burger King used to have an ad campaign that featured a song that went, have it your way at Burger King. Robert, have you ever heard that? No, Dave, I can't okay. say I have, but that, that was pretty good. That That's why I explained that, because I've been told <laughs> that some of my references um, are not age appropriate. But uh, anyway, the, the whole idea was uh, if you go to Burger King, you can get a hamburger any way you want it. Uh, whereas if you went to McDonald's, you were stuck with whatever they served. I don't know why. I don't know why you would mess with the uh, the Whopper with bacon and cheese. It's, it's perfection in a burger. Well, except for Whataburger. Okay, so we see this type of specification all the time uh, where the engineer wants to tell us what type of valve to use, what type of strainer. Um, they've got some construction requirements. Um, 
everything. And sometimes it's very detailed. And, you know, once upon a time, this made sense. But um, the way things are working now, um, no pump manufacturer is going to change all their bill of materials uh, for this specification. And we put a lot of thought into the components that we use in our fuel systems. And, and we ship 20 to 30 pump sets per month. And I, I mentioned that, that I read the service tickets uh, for all of our technicians at, at Preferred and ACS every day. And, uh, you know, and I, I'm constantly looking for patterns. You know, is there a device that they're always working on? Um, there is one device that, that I think is problematic. And now every time I, I read about a technician working on it, I copy paste their report and send it to our engineering manager because I'd like them to start looking at an alternate. But you know, the gist of this is we we don't use the components we use um, on accident. Uh, we use them because they work and because they're relatively trouble free. And I feel like uh, the preferred people have a lot of ownership of our projects because really we're responsible for them. You know. Uh, starting up correctly, and we're responsible for them really through the warranty period. So um, we're really not motivated to just use the, the cheapest stuff we can because when we ship something, we we just forget all about it. You know, it's it's our project at, at least through the warranty period, if not you know really forever. So um, and then another reason why uh, this doesn't work in this day and age is with the current supply chain issues. It's it's a full-time job for our engineers and our purchasing people just to keep the parts that we need to build our standard fuel systems in stock. You know, if we were to, you know, have to use a certain ball valve and a certain strainer on a job, that's just more components we have to track down and and who knows if, you know, what the lead times are on these components anymore. Um it's it's shocking how long the lead times are on components these days that used to be you know one to two weeks if not you know somebody had them in stock. Um, there is a big exception to this though, and that's that's plants that require ASME 31.1 or 31.3. Um, that's uh, ANSI 31.1 is the power piping code that you see in in power plants. And 31.3 is sort of the chemical plant equivalent of that. And they they can't have low melting point materials and they can't have any bronze or copper. And, and if that's what this particular plant needs, fantastic. We have alternatives that, uh, that meet ANSI 31.1 or 31.3. And we do it often enough that it's, it's really not a big deal anymore. Okay, design mistake number seven that, that we see pretty often, and that's putting a big up and over in the suction piping. Um, it's not super common, that's why we put it at the end, but um, if this doesn't get caught on paper and makes it all the way out to the field, um, it can be a very expensive fix. So that's why I wanted to include it. Um, so I'm a real engineer. I took, I think, two semesters of fluid mechanics, but this problem wasn't really obvious to me until someone explained it to me. Um, priming the up and over is an obvious problem, and we should specify a priming T at the top of the up and over. But even properly primed, the problem is sucking the oil up the upside of the up and over. You may not be able to pull enough vacuum to get the oil up to the top of the up and over. And the pressure can get so low that you can actually vaporize the fuel in the up and over and cause the pumps to cavitate. Um, both times when I've diagnosed this problem for a contractor, the response was, oh, we can't relocate the pipe. Well, we can't change high school physics either. So uh, in most cases, the pipe just has to be relocated. So the alternative to this, and, and this is why this presentation is way more commercial than, than most of our presentations is, uh, the alternative is, Specify the entire system preferred. Uh, we are more of a full service contractor and we're gonna make sure the entire fuel system is coordinated uh, to meet the needs of the generators or the boilers that we're supplying. And we'll even uh, review 
your generator submittals. I, I did this today for a customer. I reviewed their genset submittal to see what was included with their belly tanks. And we'll review your uh, main tank submittal to make sure that, that all the stuff that Preferred puts on the main tank or the belly tank and everything in between is coordinated to work uh, for the equipment. And you'll get a job-specific sequence so that you can review and make sure that the fuel system is going to do what you want it to do. And you'll get a job-specific wiring schematic for each of the controllers so that you can see how things are wired. And, and this makes things easier on the contractor, too. Um, a lot of wiring schematics now and a lot of like car manuals have a lot of equipment that's optional. So you're looking at a schematic and then you're wondering, well, do I really have this equipment or not? And sometimes there'll be lots of different options on the wiring schematic. Our wiring schematics are job specific. So if you see a device on the wiring schematic, that's the device that was shipped and that's the device that's on the bill of materials as well. And we have some very, very um, experienced engineers working in our fuel system group. Um, the manager of that group, Dennis, has been with the company 30 years. Actually, Sal just retired last Friday after 40 years. Uh, Charlotte does a little bit of everything in the fuel system group. She's been with the company 33 years. Marlon's been doing fuel systems for 15 years. We have two Jeffs in uh, our fuel system group. One's been in the industry 17 years, and those has been with us three years. And then... Uh, one of our programmers has been with the company 15 years. Another programmer has been with us six years. And then our kind of our ranking fuel system technician, Don, has been with the company 23 years. And as of a couple of weeks ago, Don is now our, our service manager. So um, there isn't anything that these people haven't seen before. And Dave, I just wanted to jump in there and, and also say, as like you were saying, you know, as far as having us, spec you know, help assist engineers specify at the end of the day, you know, who's the one starting it up? It's going to be our technicians. So, you know, we, you know, hope to have a, you know, a stake in the long-term project too. So it's not just, uh, you know, we would specify something and walk away. You know, our intent is to be there for the long term and then develop the relationship with the customer and provide maintenance and assistance uh, for them, you know, you know, ongoing. So we're in it for the long haul. Yeah, I, I don't think I mentioned this presentation, but Preferred was founded in 1920. So we're in our 102nd year and Robert is a fifth generation ownership of the company. So uh, that is definition long haul. Uh, finally, uh, we did something new and different in the fuel system industry about three years ago. Uh, our, the R&D department at Preferred came up with a new controller for our fuel system, so we call a NodeNet controller. It's one small microprocessor that works with um, a four inch touchscreen and um, it's not Allen Bradley or Koyo or anything like that. It's actually developed by Preferred for our fuel systems. We locate one small microprocessor and four-inch touchscreen at each pump set, at each day tank, and each polisher. And then all the local devices uh, on each piece of equipment is wired into this controller at the Preferred factory. And then the NodeNet controllers communicate with each other via a proprietary, redundant, non-hackable digital communication protocol uh, that we call NodeNet. And uh, from any of the four inch touchscreens, you can view all the information on the network, you know, whether you're standing in front of a day tank or standing in front of the pump set. And it's wonderful, especially out, I mean, I'm in, I'm in Dallas. Some of our fuel systems are spread out across entire campuses. And as long as you can see one of the touchscreens, you can see everything that's going on in the fuel system. The wiring of NodeNet is two three-conductor Belden cables. And uh, it's two channels. So uh, channel one is uh, 112, 113, and one, 111, 112, and 113. And channel two is 115, 116, and 117. Both channels run uh, continuously. And if one channel loses communication, uh, the system alarms, but it keeps going. And it keeps running on the other channel, and your, your system isn't down. And if you call it, if you use this Belden cable that we specify, uh, the Belden cable is black, white, red. 
So it makes it very hard to make a wiring mistake because all your 111s may be white, all your 112s would be red, all your 113s would be black. So it's easy to wire, and it's a lot less wiring than bringing all these hardware devices back to a, uh, a central PLC. And since um, since we implemented this NodeNet infrastructure about three years ago, I think we shipped out over 1,500 controllers, uh, this NodeNet controller in it, and our service technicians like it better, uh, the installing contractors like it better, and um, and part-time service technicians like me really like it better because it takes a what used to be a very big problem, you know, 16 wires to each day tank times however many day tanks, and it cuts it down into, into smaller and smaller portions. So if we put a node net controller on a day tank, you're, the wiring schematic is just going to have the I/O for that day tank. And if the um, and if you have six day tanks, the wiring schematics might be identical, but you get one for each each day tank, so it's easy to follow along. And if we have if we have to be more cost conscious, uh, one of these node net controllers can do as many as three day tanks. And for our smaller projects, a node net controller can do a pump set up to two main tanks and up to uh, up to three day tanks. So our smaller systems are just what we call single node, but the bigger systems are are multi node and it cuts down on the uh, on the field wiring by a ton. So. It's a very reliable communication network. It's two channel redundant. Both channels run at the same time. There's no communication settings like Modbus or Ethernet or BACnet, and there's no external access to NodeNet, so uh, nobody can break into it. Um, there's really only three things that have to happen for the NodeNet controllers to communicate. All the NodeNet controllers have to have matching programs in them, and uh, nine times out of ten, it's it's only preferred factory people that are putting programs into controllers, so this isn't a problem. Uh, there's a little dial on each NodeNet controller that needs to be set to the correct node, and then at least one of the two NodeNet channels need to, needs to be wired correctly, and that's it. You do those three things and the system communicates. Finally, uh, the NodeNet controllers can be swapped out really quickly. Um, no matter how many NodeNet controllers you have on site, if you have a big fuel system, uh, one spare can back up all of your all of your node net controllers because um, what you'll do is uh, you'll take out the old if you let the smoke out of a node net controller uh, it wires by quick disconnects so it's easy to pull the old wiring off you put the new controller in and then when you power it up again you put in an SD card with the program loaded onto it and then the node net controller knows when there's an SD card loaded in its slot that it uploads that program before it reboots. So um, you can drop a program into a NodeNet controller <clears throat> using your laptop and a USB A to B cable, or you can use the SD card. And what I do with my customers here in Dallas is I'll back up their programs to an SD card and then stick it in a little Ziploc bag and then tape that Ziploc bag to the inside door of the enclosure. And that way, if any of their NodeNet controllers uh, dies for whatever reason, um, you can replace it with a spare and then load the uh, the program up from the SD card. And the only reason I can recall that we've had node net controllers die was somebody applied the wrong voltage to them. So uh, they've been pretty reliable other than that. Okay, so some common objections to specifying preferred. Uh, we can't sole source in our specifications. Well, yes, you can. Uh, we see it all the time. And as consulting engineers, you have a responsibility to the owner to provide a, a high quality system that's going to work. Sole sourcing is not fair to the other suppliers. No, it's not fair. Um, our specifications have to be open. Uh, you can write an open specification, but uh, just put in this, this phrase right here. Fuel system control shall include redundant two-channel digital communication innate to the distributed fuel system controllers, and that specifies uh, preferred. So uh, we're going to start our questions and answers now with Robert, and uh, the most common question we get is, can I get a copy of the presentation? And yes, you can. Just email me or Robert 
and uh, we will send you a, a copy of the PowerPoint we used today. And um, after Megan cleans up all the ums and ahs and stuff out of the, the audio, she will post it on our YouTube page. Uh, just go to YouTube and search on Preferred Utilities and then click the video tab and you'll be able to see this webinar and all of our, all of our past webinars too. Okay, everybody, thanks for hanging around to the end. Um, if you didn't notice, we pre-record uh, most of the webinar and then we do a live questions and answers afterwards. And I had Robert Bond uh, on when we did the, um, the webinar recording and I found out that Robert is really shy and he just, um, he didn't speak up all that much. So I've got a few questions for Robert that, that I came up with uh, while watching this webinar and um, we'll take your questions as well. I actually show you logged into the meeting twice and uh, and both of your both of your things are muted. Hey, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Excellent. All right. Okay. Thanks so, for doing this with us, Robert. Of course. So, Thanks for having me. So you're in Danbury, but um, <laughs> your home base really is New York City. So most of the work that you do is in New York City. And because the codes are all different in New York City, um, it's always been good to have a New York City person on the uh, on the call because um, I usually get stumped by New York City questions. So uh, the first question I had for you is because things are are more difficult in New York City because you've got to deal with local codes as well as national codes. Does it seem like the engineers are more likely to to come to an expert for help in designing a fuel system? Yeah, uh, we get calls uh, daily. You know, even if it's just you know, just friend, you know, engineering friends that we've had in the past, just with questions that, and we do this day in and day out. We, you know, myself and John Haber, we know the New York City uh, mechanical code pretty well. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, the code is, it's not always changing. Well, they're coming out with a new code, actually. It's supposed to, they were supposed to release it in September. Um, now it's probably going to get pushed to October, but it's going to be a brand new mechanical code. And there are some significant changes to the fuel oil uh, piping and um, tanks and pump set selections uh, or um, sections of that spec. So yeah, I mean we do we get we get questions all the time. We're more than happy to help, um, even to come out into the field and take a look at you know and take a look at stuff. Um, but yeah, we're you know always more than happy to you know to answer questions for people. Okay. Um, I mentioned in the uh, in the presentation uh, with the Burger King specification that we are seeing a trend of, of people that don't want uh, copper alloys or low melting point materials in their fuel systems. Are you seeing that in New York City too? Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. And I mean, w one big push that I've been seeing in New York City recently is the um, push to add more uh, biodiesel um as opposed to to two oil so traditionally um the fuel oil that's been burned in boilers and even in some generators is you know five to ten percent um bio um biodiesel and now it's they're making the jump to b20 uh with ul's recent approval uh of a b20 standard um there's a significant push to go to b100 um when you make that jump from uh e even with b20 um you know, some some experts recommend getting rid of all your um, your yellow metals, basically your brass and your bronze valves, um, and just going with um, steel um, or iron valves. And um, definitely, when you go to the B100, you're going to want to do that because what it, it causes the the valve to um, it doesn't necessarily corrode, but it 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 um, it forms a um, I cannot find the word that I'm looking for. Uh, it causes more junk basically to build up in your fuel oil system, which eventually settles into your tank, and then it will rot out your tank, um, you know, while it sits down there if you don't properly maintain your fuel oil system. So, you know, in addition to the, you know, with the getting rid of the yellow metal material um, filtration systems, they're going to become a real, um, a real thing to highlight um, in, you know, fuel oil systems in the future in New York City. 
Okay, and you're selling preferred pump sets in New York City now that are rated for B20 and B100, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's um, preferred is, uh, you know, did a good bit of research for us and um, based on, um, you know, some papers that they, you know, that they've, um, that have been published by the U.S. Uh, Department of Energy, um, uh, specifically on, on biofuels, um, preferred was able to come up with a pump set that uh, yeah is rated and we're we're B100 ready basically even though you know UL is still a number of steps behind us um, as far as um, approving and getting a listing for that fuel they only have up to B20 currently um, but we're we are prepared uh, and selling a pump set that is B100 ready um, and that and we're anticipating different viscosity changes and how we're going to um, you know account for those in this. This is one of the, the beauties of preferred utilities is when you have a hundred year old history, that goes you know way back to you know when two oil wasn't even a thought, and um, you know all the different fuels that preferred is pumped and and burned over the years with our burners. Um, we have an incredible amount of uh, you know knowledge, and um, you, you know we're we're happy to work with a you know a manufacturer uh, like preferred you know as the rep in New York City. Okay, I was going to ask you about the burners next. Um, so UL UL is up to UL recently revised uh, twenty UL twenty standard twenty ninety six to include B twenty for burners, and mm -hmm. preferred um, preferred got the their burners UL listed up to B twenty against the standard, correct? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, we've had a number of uh, inquiries uh, regarding that. Um, and another cool thing that we've been doing, um, if, if anyone out there has an old, you know, legacy burner, um, what we're doing at a specific New York City school is we're taking an old preferred rotary cup that was built in 1956 um, in excellent condition. Uh, this thing had burned uh, four oil back in the day, then two oil um, nowadays, and then they're converting it to B20 um, with the goal of B100 in the future. But because it's an old burner um, and UL won't give a, um, a you know a, a UL listing for that burner directly, what we've gotten UL to do is we're doing a field UL listing. We bring UL UL out in the field. We are, you know go through their system. We address all their comments, and at the end of the day, we're going to get a stamp for that um, for that site where it's you know the whole site is basically UL listed, the fuel oil system and the burner boiler system. Um, so it's it's pretty cool. Um, if if you have a customer out there that that is you know anxious to have that UL approval, um, we have ways of optimizing your system to where you can get a UL site approval. And UL is working on on expanding, I think 2096 to B100 as well. Did I hear that correct? Yeah, um, I I've heard that they're working on that. I you know they have. Obviously, they're only at B20. Um, to jump to B100 would be a stretch in my, you know, my imagination. I think they would work their way up. Um, but uh, it, it's definitely something that I know very large agencies in New York City are interested in. Um, obviously, being pushed by the local politicians and administration um, here. So. It actually seems like New York is, you know, it's usually California that drives this sort of thing, but it, it seems like it's New York that's driving uh, biodiesel this time. Yeah, I, and I think the the reason for that is there's such a um, a fuel oil base here in the Northeast, and especially in New York City, where people are used to having fuel oil. There are places that I go to in Brooklyn that have never had natural gas. They're never going to get a natural gas main, you know, into Brooklyn. Um, the infrastructure is just not there. And, you know, they've burnt six oil for up until 2020. When it turned illegal, they switched to four oil. And, you know, 2030, if four oil is going to be illegal, they'll go to two oil. And then from there, you know, it's going to be biodiesel all the way, just because you're never going to, they're never going to get gas. And this is, you know, what they have to do. Yeah. Um, so that, I'm, that I'm might really be not. Thing. I'm not real concerned about burning B100 because um, we burned a lot of similar fuels in the past, and actually, 
for two, two and a half years now, Preferred has burned something called biodiesel residual oil in our two shop burners. And biodiesel mm -hmm. re residual oil is basically all the stuff they take out of biodiesel so that biodiesel can meet its ASTM spec. So it's a heavy fuel, um, it needs to be heated, and the viscosity changes from, from delivery to delivery and uh, we've been burning it for a couple of years. Uh, B100 will be a much cleaner, much more consistent fuel than what we've been burning in our shop. Right, right. Okay, so getting back to uh, the fuel handling projects and how they go, I, I just wanted to point out that um, uh, we talked in the, in the presentation about reconciling the, uh, the drawings and the specifications, and that's, that's something that your local preferred person would be glad to help you with. Um, it seems like I've worked on a few projects lately where you know the engineers spent a lot of time doing the drawings and the schedules, and we're hoping to not have to do a specification at all, and then at the last minute had to do a specification, and just a lot of times that's a big copy paste. But uh, you know that's what preferred people are are here for is to help with that uh, specification and making it match the drawings. And it's it's easier on on everyone. Um, Robert, do you ever see projects in New York City that, that just have drawings and schedules, no specs? Uh, I haven't personally seen it. It's it's um, it is pretty rare to to only see drawings. Um, sometimes the contractor will only send the drawing, um, you know, not thinking that you know they never look at the spec, so they they assume we don't have to, but obviously we do. Um, a lot of times I see the copy paste and it's a really, you know, sometimes there's, I mean, many times there, there's just a lot of stuff in there that just does not apply uh, to that actual job. Um, the one thing I will say though, is that, you know, the New York city code obviously is, is different than um, anywhere else in the world. Um, but we ACS, we've developed our own uh, master spec for, for a fuel oil system that adheres to the New York City Building Code and actually references portions of the New York City Mechanical Code as well. Um, so that way, you know, you're always just referencing back to that. Um, and we, you know, we'll, we will customize it for you. If you give us a call and, you know, talk us through your fuel oil system, send us a, you know, even just a hand sketch, we will customize our New York City you know, specification for you guys, and then you can just drop that in. Um, so, you know, we're more than happy to do that work, you know, with with you guys. We see it as a partnership. Right. And I, I just had an example yesterday of something we talked about where um, we are designing a fuel system that's going to be working with belly tanks, and the generators and the belly tanks are already on order, and, and they have to be, because I hear that uh, generator lead times now are over a year. Yep. So um, I actually went through the submittal because there's there's a few pieces of equipment that need to be on a belly tank uh, when you're going to have uh, a remote fill situation. And I went through the submittal and found that um, there wasn't anything on the belly tank basically except a low a low switch to shut off the generator if the fuel got too low. So we you know so I planned on we're going to supply the flow control manifold. We'll do the floats in the tank. And we'll do the return pump also. And I had a phone call just a week ago from an engineer on a project that we designed a couple of years ago and shipped just recently. And the engineer called and asked why uh, why we supplied a return pump on the job. And you know, I looked through the drawings again and I said, well, because it's on the drawings. He says, well, the belly tank people supplied it too. So uh -huh. you know, at that point, I asked, did if ours isn't installed yet, you're you're welcome to send it back. You know, assuming that the return pump with the belly tank um, meets the spec and and then will flow more than the supply pumps, which is kind of an NFPA requirement. And and you and John provide that service pretty often too, right? Yeah. Now I'll say the one thing is in New York City, you're not allowed to have a return pump. Uh, period. It's always gravity return. But um, yeah, I mean we we will spec the job out for you. Um, you know, our, you know, I said that in the presentation, but you know, we, you know, if we screw up, you know, if we gave bad information ever to an engineer, which in, in my recollection, we haven't yet, 
Um, but if we if we spec the thing out wrong and it, it you know we get the job you know as a bit as a as a contractor and it, you know to me it's on us to to correct that you know like I said it's a partnership and we're there to you know to own the job and you know to be there long term. Um, so that's yeah, that's kinda and I would it. much rather review things and get them right when they're still on paper. Of course. Yeah, much easier, much cleaner, much less uh, heartache for everybody when you can when you can reconcile everything on paper first. All right. Yeah, we like and like you said, yeah, we like to get as many. You know, obviously we create our own submittals and they're very complete compared to other, you know, other manufacturers that I've seen. It's like ch it's chicken scratch and a couple cut sheets. Um, what you get for wiring diagrams, but um, you know. If we can, you know, we make our own, but if we can get any other information about the generator or, you know, the entire rest of the system, it really does help to weed out, you know, those little those little problems that, that pop up in the field. Yeah. And I, I thought of something while I was watching this webinar uh, earlier that, you know, uh, problem number one was giving the contractor and the suppliers too many choices. And it dawned on me when an engineer gives you know, that many choices to the contractor, when they get a, a drawing package or when they get a submittal to review, you know, it, it's up to the engineer again to make sure that that whatever they submitted is actually going to work. You know, whereas if you if you specify one thing and then you see a submittal that has that one thing on it, you know, you still got to do your due diligence to make sure it's going to work, but there's just a, a lot less investigation that has to go on. Yeah, I mean, we see that we have, you know, in this fuel oil world in New York City, you wouldn't believe the amount of, you know, little pump shops that pop up, um, you know, and try to compete on a, uh, you know, a big data center or something like that. And it's, you know, if the if the engineer allows that in the specification and it's not, if you're not specific enough and stringent enough on, on your requirements, uh, you wouldn't believe uh you know the people that will pop up and bid a job that is frankly is just way over their head and it, it creates a, a monster of a project and often they're low bid too so it, it, it uh, makes course. it tough it's on always, everybody always. Yeah. Well, the, and the contractor's happy you know he's happy to get a, a good number um you know but uh yeah you gotta watch out for that stuff sure. uh, megan did did you get any questions on the chat oh yes i do i have a couple here um, one is, are flow meters required in systems serving the generator? They are not required in most of the country. Robert, what about New York City? They are not required. Okay. Yeah, we, we almost never put flow meters on, uh, on genset projects. Um, they're a little more common on boiler projects, uh, but, um, on a boiler project, if there is going to be an oil flow meter, it's usually within the scope of the burner manufacturer. The only exception I can think of to that is the VA hospital projects, where they want a oil flow supply and an oil flow return meter on the, the header upstream of all the burners so that they can keep track of total consumption in the plant. But hmm. um, man, I don't think I've ever seen a fuel, fuel oil meter on a genset job. Okay, and then the next one we have is, do previous specifications need to be updated on NodeNet? We made the change to NodeNet about three years ago. So anything more than three years old is going to have our older uh, processor, uh, the PWC processor, or you know sometimes we called that the D5 tank gauge. So yeah, if you if you want to dust off a specification that's more than three years old, you know, just just search and see if it has PWC or D5 tank gauge in it, and then um, we'll be happy. We've actually got a master spec we can send you that's written around NodeNet, or we'd be happy to take your old spec and and update it to to NodeNet. Um, it is quite a it is quite a difference, and I hope I made it clear, you know, in the presentation. Um, NodeNet is distributed control, and um, I work in Dallas, so most of my jobs are in in Texas. And we have big uh, we have big university campuses, and we have big healthcare campuses. 
And being able to put a small processor uh, by the day tanks or by the generators, and then one by the pump set, and then out by the tank farm, uh, really reduces the field wiring a lot. And and sometimes these are physically spread out over you know a couple hundred yards. It's nice to be able to see everything that's going on in the fuel system um, from the touchscreen. And and whether you're at the pump set or the day tank or the main tanks, you can see the whole system from uh, from any of the touchscreens. So um, we went kind of from central control with one big uh, processor to distributed control with a lot of little processors speaking NodeNet together. And um, I think our customers, our service technicians definitely like it better. It's made the startups uh, much, much easier than one big processor. Okay, so I think that's all that's in the chat box for questions. Okay. On my end. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to conclude with a little bit about uh, supply chain issues, and we are seeing them like like everybody is. And you know, uh, I read today that the railroad strike may have been averted, but uh, I'm also reading that manufacturing plants in Europe are shutting down because they don't have any natural gas. And China is still locking down cities because of COVID. So I, I don't think the supply chain issues are going to get better soon on their own. And um, it's become a, a pretty big job for our, our engineers and our purchasing people just to, to keep up with demand here. But um, on the fuel oil side, I'd say that our, our lead times have increased maybe a week or two in response to supply chain issues. So, um, you know, the longest lead time I'm putting on proposals these days for fuel systems is like 12 to 14 weeks. And the uh, the small ones, you know, like a pump set and a, and a back pressure regulating valve, those are still those are still six to eight weeks most of the time. But um, it's always good to check, you know, uh, before you place an order with us, check to make sure that, you know, our lead times are, are still the same. But we are definitely shorter than the main tanks and the gen sets at this point. Robert, anything else to add before we sign off? No, I, I think I'm all set. Thanks thanks again for having me on. Um, okay. And everybody, yeah. thanks for sticking, sticking out to the end. Um, our next webinar is going to be in about six weeks, and I believe it's going to be on uh, fundamentals of flame safeguard for boilers and furnaces. And uh, we're going to have a special guest on that one, uh, Steve Pelt, who has spent his entire career uh, doing flame safeguard and boiler controls. So certainly an expert on the topic. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Megan, for putting this on. No problem. Glad to be here. <laughs>